Hi, I'm George, and you're watching The Return of the King Channel. At the rapture, I've always wondered where exactly do we meet with Jesus in the air? For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Jesus is no stranger to this earthly location. In fact, during his time on earth, Jesus ventured into this location twice to notify his supernatural adversaries of his presence. This location is commonly referred to as the place or the land of the serpent. Dr. Michael Heiser in his book, The Unseen Realm, tells us where and why Jesus went to these two locations. By the time of the events in the region known in Old Testament days as Bashan, Peter's confession at Caesarea Philippi, and the transfiguration on Mount Hermon, Jesus knew that the hour of his death was fast approaching. He had provoked a confrontation with intelligent evil in many ways over the years of his ministry. But what he did and said in those two places was especially defiant. The move was calculated. Paul in Ephesians 6.12 makes it very clear who our adversaries are. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The tribulation is a seven-year battle against the forces of darkness that ultimately leads to their defeat. Christ intends to unleash his wrath upon the world, but before he does so, he will first remove his bride, as she is not meant to experience his wrath. Before Jesus undertook the crucifixion, he ventured twice into the land of the serpent, where the gates of hell are situated, to serve notice to the powers of darkness. The first purpose was to inform them of his mission to reclaim his kingdom, and the second was to provoke them, to goad them into taking action to eliminate him. Their belief was that by killing Jesus, they could overcome him. Jesus devised the plan, and they took the bait. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do the people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Peter's name in Greek means rock, but Dr. Heiser believes there's much more to the story. For sure there is wordplay going on in Peter's confession, but I would suggest there is also an important double entendre. The rock refers to the mountain location where Jesus makes the statement. When viewed from this perspective, Peter confesses Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, at this rock, this mountain, Mount Hermon. Why? This place was considered the gates of hell, the gateway to the realm of the dead in Old Testament times. The theological messaging couldn't be more dramatic. Jesus says he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We often think of this phrase as though God's people are in a posture of having to bravely fend off Satan and his demons. This simply isn't correct. Gates are defensive structures, not offensive weapons. The kingdom of God is the aggressor. Jesus begins at ground zero in the cosmic geography of both testaments to announce the great reversal. It is the gates of hell that are under assault, and they will not hold up against the church. Hell will one day be Satan's tomb. This is a map of the area that Jesus went to to put the powers of darkness on notice. The green highlighted area shown here represents the territory of Bashan, which was under the dominion of King Og, a Rephaim, a giant, 
the land or the place of the serpent. And Og, king of Bashan, one of the remnant of the Raphaim, who lived at Ashtaroth and Edrai, and ruled over Mount Hermon here in the north, and Selica in the south, and all Bashan to the boundary of the Geshurites and the Machathites, and over half of Gilead to the boundary of Sihon, king of Heshbon. This is the location that Michael Heiser refers to as Ground Zero. It is the very place where 200 angels descended upon Mount Hermon and initiated the rebellion against God. These celestial beings are known as the Watchers in the book of Enoch and Daniel. Their original purpose was to watch over humanity and guide them in the ways of righteousness. However, they made the fateful choice to seek godlike status and be adorned as deities instead. If you ask a modern Christian why the world is so wicked, they often point to the fall in Genesis 3. But in the time of the Second Temple, Jews had a different view. They believed that the Watchers were responsible for evil on earth. The New Testament writers, who were mostly Jewish and from that time, also shared this belief. We don't see it because we're not looking through the same lens as Second Temple Jews. The transformation of Christ occurred here on Mount Hermon. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. Michael Heiser, in his book Unseen Realm, explains why this occurred at Mount Hermon and why this location is so important. The imagery is striking. We've seen already that the Jewish tradition about the descent of the Watchers, the sons of God of Genesis 6, 1-4, through 4, informed the writings of Peter and Jude. Now we see that the transfiguration of Jesus takes place on the same location identified by that tradition. Jesus picks Mount Hermon to reveal to Peter, James, and John exactly who he is, the embodied glory essence of God, the divine name, made visible by incarnation. The meaning is just as transparent. I'm putting the hostile powers of the unseen world on notice. I've come to earth to take back what is mine. The kingdom of God is at hand. He continues, The account of Peter's confession at the foot of Mount Hermon and the revelation of the transfiguration on its unholy slopes marked a key transition point in Jesus' life particularly as the Gospel of Mark presents it. After he throws down the gauntlet at the Transfiguration, he begins to move towards Jerusalem to his death. The enemy knows who Jesus is, but as noted earlier, the forces of darkness do not know the plan. Jesus has baited them into action, and act they will. He has given them the rope, and they will eagerly hang themselves with it. Jesus will go to Jerusalem to drink from the cup that the Father has planned for him. But the instrument of death will be the catalyst that launches the kingdom of God in its full force. Geography plays a crucial role in the unseen realm. Inhabited by principalities, cosmic powers, and the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Among all the nations on earth, God selected Abraham to establish a nation that would be his own. He laid the foundation for his future nation, Israel, within the dominant power of that era, Egypt. The mightiest nation on earth naturally boasted the most formidable gods. Then the Lord conveyed to Abram, Be certain that your descendants will become sojourners in a foreign land, serving as slaves and enduring affliction for four hundred years. However, I will pass judgment on the nation they serve, and they will emerge with great possessions. Four centuries later, the budding Jewish nation in Egypt grew so populous that the Egyptians began to fear them. 
God raises up Moses to liberate them from severe Egyptian oppression. God rescues the Israelites from Pharaoh and the Egyptian deities, proving that they couldn't rival the Most High God of the Israelites. To demonstrate his supremacy to the world, God directed the Israelites to encamp in front of the Red Sea. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell the people of Israel to turn back and camp in front of Piahiroth, between Migdal and the sea, in front of Baal Zephon. You shall encamp facing it by the sea. Pharaoh will say of the Israelites, They are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. And I will receive glory over Pharaoh and his entire army. Then the Egyptians will acknowledge that I am the Lord. During the Exodus, all nations served the respect of gods, which were indeed real. The Egyptians had their gods, as did the Canaanites and the Amorites, among others. In Canaanite and Amorite religion, Baal reigned as the king of the gods, the most powerful of them all. His sacred place was Mount Safan in Turkey. The spot where God had the Israelites in camp was named after their mightiest god, Baal, and his dwelling, Mount Safan. God intended to reveal to the world not only who the most powerful God was, but also to the gods ruling over these nations. After the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, Pharaoh and his army followed on dry ground. When they were in the middle of the sea, God had Moses extend his hand, causing the waters to rush back and engulf Pharaoh and his forces. The world's mightiest army had been defeated by the God of the Jews, with the Israelites only needing to watch. News of the Red Sea's parting and subsequent drowning of the Egyptians spread to all the nations. As a result, these nations began to fear the Israelites and their God. When the Israelites sent two spies into Jericho to scout the city, Rahab concealed them from the king. She spoke these words to the spies. I know that the Lord has given you the land and that a sense of dread has fallen upon us. And the inhabitants of the land are filled with terror because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. At the rapture, I believe we will meet near Mount Hermon. The world won't see this, but the powers of darkness will. The majority of Christians are often unaware of the significant events that transpired on Mount Hermon and their crucial relevance to the mission of Jesus Christ. On Mount Hermon, 200 angels descended and concocted a malevolent scheme to take human women as their wives, resulting in the birth of children who were part human and part angelic. These particular offspring became known as the Nephilim, often referred to as the giants. When these Nephilim met their demise, God forbade their spirits from returning to heaven, leading to the emergence of what we now recognize as demons. These are the demons that Jesus casts out of people. Dr. Michael Heiser has written a book called Reversing Hermon, Enoch, The Watchers, and the Forgotten Mission of Jesus Christ that explores these ideas. Now let's look at how what Dr. Heiser has to say about how the New Testament writers viewed the spread of evil in the world. If one were to ask a modern Christian, why is the world and all humanity so thoroughly wicked? The chances are very high that an answer of the fall would be forthcoming. We have been conditioned by church history, ancient and modern, to look only at Genesis 3 for such theology. But if you ask a Jew living in the Second Temple period the same question, the answer would be dramatically different. Yes, the entrance of sin into God's good world occurred in Eden, but the unanimous testimony of Second Temple Judaism is that the watchers are to blame for the proliferation of evil on the earth. The New Testament writers, being predominantly Jewish in products of the Second Temple period, more often than not telegraphed the same outlook. We just can't see it because, frankly, we don't have Second Temple Jewish eyes. We miss what the original audience would have seen. To narrow our focus, a number of New Testament passages say what they say because they are literary expressions of a significant theme in New Testament theology. The reversal of the wickedness that has permeated the human race. Many readers will recognize that Mount Hermon is the place where, according to 1 Enoch 6.6, the watchers descended and took an oath to commit the transgressions described in Genesis 6, 1-4. This book's title, Reversing Hermon, alludes to the notion, 
hidden in plain sight in a surprising number of New Testament passages, that what happened in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, had to be reversed as part of restoring the original Edenic vision. That reversal was, is, and will be accomplished by the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. Hidden within the landscape of Egypt, the Red Sea, and Israel is the story of the rapture. Up at the top of the map, we find Mount Hermon. Right below it is the Sea of Galilee. Further down, you'll see the Dead Sea, and just below that, Mount Sinai. This is the very mountain where, when the trumpet of God sounded, Moses went up and God came down, symbolic of the rapture. It was at Mount Sinai that God betrothed the Israelites as his bride. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command and with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God. It wouldn't surprise me if the trumpet of God heard round the world at the rapture originates from Mount Sinai, just as it did to summon the Israelites to the base of the mountain to meet with God. When this trumpet sounds, Christ will appear for the third time, somewhere above this region, near Mount Hermon, and what's referred to as the Gates of Hell. The account of the 153 fish occurred at the Sea of Galilee. It was the third time Jesus revealed himself to his disciples after his resurrection. Within this story lies the rapture of the church. After the trumpet of God sounds, the dead in Christ will rise first. Above Mount Sinai is the Dead Sea. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Moving further north from the Dead Sea, we arrive at the Sea of Galilee, the setting for the account of the 153 fish. The catch of fish is so large that their net cannot be hauled into the boat, but remains in the water. Jesus instructs them to bring some of the freshly caught fish to him. These fish, still alive, represent the living, foreshadowing those who will be present during the rapture. Just above the Sea of Galilee stands Mount Hermon and the gates of hell. Jesus is delivering a final warning to the forces of darkness. Judgment day has arrived, but first I will rescue my bride, and then I'm coming to take back what is mine. Throughout history, various ancient civilizations, including the Jewish nation, held the belief that mountaintops served as gateways to and from the heavenly realm. Mount Hermon is particularly significant because it's where the 200 angels descended from heaven to earth. And it will also serve as our departure point to heaven, where we will always be with the Lord. The timing of the rapture can be discerned by aligning the constellations of the Red Dragon and the fishes with the geographical features of the Red Sea. Visualize the Red Sea and its two gulf extensions as a symbolic keyhole. Within this landscape, we find the constellation of the Red Dragon and the fishes acting as the key to unlock this hidden mystery. It appears that God has given us a clue to finding the correct key that fits this terrestrial keyhole. The dragon mentioned in Revelation chapter 12 is described as a red dragon. It's fitting to ponder, where would a red dragon dwell if not in a red sea? While there are numerous dragons in various constellations, only one resembles a sea dragon. And what might a sea dragon dine upon? Fish, of course. The dragon in Revelation chapter 12 symbolizes the devil or Satan, while the Christian symbol is the fish. This dragon from Revelation 12 seeks to metaphorically devour the Christians, symbolized by the fish. Interestingly, there's only one location in the heavens where we find both a sea dragon and fishes together. The constellation of Cetus and Pisces, representing Satan and the Christian respectively. Now, when the constellations of Cetus and Pisces are overlaid on the Red Sea, a remarkable alignment occurs. The dragon and the fishes harmoniously match the Red Sea and its two gulfs. It appears that we have found the correct key to solve this riddle, hidden within the landscape of the Red Sea and the Promised Land. To gain insight into when the rapture might occur, we need to observe the appearance of celestial signs within the constellations of the dragon and the fishes. Notably, on April 8, 2024, an eclipse will appear precisely on the band of the fish on the right side of the constellation Pisces. This particular eclipse takes place in the same gulf where the Red Sea is said to have parted. 
allowing the Israelites to escape from Pharaoh and its pursuing army. Adding to the significance of this event, Venus, also known as the bright morning star, will simultaneously appear above the tail of the dragon, coinciding with Mount Sinai on the map. Understanding the specific location where we meet the Lord in the air strengthens the narrative of the rapture, woven into the sands of Egypt, the Red Sea, and the Promised Land. To uncover the full story surrounding the timing of the rapture, click on the link to the video appearing here. The continuing story can be found at the 1 hour, 1 minute, and 33 second mark. Since the release of this video, I've continued to discover additional evidence linking the Exodus and Mount Sinai to the concept of the rapture. I'm excited to delve deeper into this topic and explore further connections in upcoming videos. Thanks for your viewership and stay tuned for more intriguing revelations.